We have a super exciting panel here on the intersection of DeFi and Filecoin, or as I'm trying to create a meme around this uh, called DeFil. <laughs> and uh, we have three of the foremost experts on, on DeFi in the room here. And so I'm just super excited to, to, to get to know um, how you see the future of DeFi and Filecoin evolving in the, in the future and, and what you think are the be best use cases today. Uh, so I'll do a quick round of introductions for our audience uh, just to get those out of the way. So I'll start with Corbin. So Corbin is the head of product for Consensus Codify, which provides tokenization, trading, and compliance products for the DeFi sector. He actually also co-founded Meridio, a platform for creating and trading fractional ownership shares in real estate and funds. And prior to Consensus, uh, Corbin actually worked uh, in tech at two top hedge funds. So welcome, Corbin. Uh, Long Wang uh, is the CTO of REN, and REN is an open protocol that enables permi permissionless and private transfer of value between any blockchain. So REN's core product is REN VM, and it brings interoperability to a decentralized finance. And so welcome, Long. And uh, Stani. Stani is the founder and CEO of Aave, an open source and non-custodial custodial money uh, market protocol to earn interest on deposits and borrow assets. Uh, Stani was studying at, uh, law at the University of Helsinki when he first got into Ethereum, and he started exploring how it could impact traditional financial systems. In 2017, Stani released ETHLEND, one of the first DeFi dApps ever, and since then, he's made his mission to create tools for an open, transparent, and equitable financial system through the Navi protocol. So welcome, gentlemen. Hey, thanks for having us. Great. Right. So why don't we go around the room uh, for kind of a broader audience that's listening to this um, to this panel? Why don't you describe what DeFi is and how your project contrib contributes to the movement? And I'll start with uh, Corbin. Great, thanks, Colin. Thanks so much. Um, hey, everybody! Super excited to be chatting with you today, um, particularly just because Filecoin and DeFi are probably my most like my favorite movements in the Web3 space and to see them kind of starting to come together is just really exciting. Um, DeFi is kind of this new concept that uh, started up probably 18 months or two years ago or so. Um, and I just describe it as any type of financial service that is being built on a permissionless blockchain or in Web3, um, which is very, very broad, right? We started out with being able to create currencies. Um, that morphed into creating stable coins, creating DEXs, creating lending protocols, and all these really, really interesting uh, financial applications that are built on top of blockchain technology, um, I think of as DeFi. So at Codify, um, we are extremely bullish about this entire sector. Um, I personally think that DeFi is permissionless blockchains kind of finding their killer app. Uh, and you can kind of see that with all the usage numbers, whether it's number of users, whether it's uh, trading volumes, whether it's uh, number of developers in the ecosystem. Uh, and we build um, all sorts of things. So we build lots of different tokenization tools, whether it's tokenizing real world uh, assets, whether it's creating wrapped versions of other blockchains and putting them onto Ethereum. Um, we recently uh, collaborated with MetaMask to launch the new swaps feature that's in the MetaMask wallet today. And we just believe that these applications, the user bases, the utility behind them are going to keep growing and growing. Um, more recently, we've collaborated with uh, Protocol Labs and the Filecoin project to release two applications. One is the storage applications that get you the best prices uh, and the best miners on the Filecoin network. So you can figure out um, uh, your best partner for hosting uh, content or data that you need to get up there. And then we're also working on a project called the DeFi Bridge, where we're going to actually take uh, native Filecoin, we're going to tokenize it on Ethereum, and then we're hopefully going to get that into uh, a lending protocol as well. So excited to talk a little bit more about those projects later on. Fantastic. So much stuff going on, Corbin. I I'm sure your team has been working around the clock to, to kind of uh, get a first version of these products out to the market uh, in time for launch. So thanks so much. Uh, Long, do you want to go next? Sure. I mean, I think uh, Corbin did a great job um, of sort of describing what DeFi is. Um, the only thing that I would really add to that is that I think one of the things that is most exciting about DeFi is not just the replication 
of what we might think of as traditional financial applications, but on a permissionless chain, but the ability to do things that you can't do in a traditional financial system. Um, I think one of the most exciting things in that space is, you know, the ability to do, uh, I mean, obviously there's the ability to do things in a permissionless way, which you can't do with traditional finance. Uh, there's the ability to do things without a middleman. Uh, you know, most of DeFi is focused around removing centralized middlemen from the equation. Um, but I also think that it allows you to do things that you really can't do in traditional finance. So the ability to take a, a transaction and interact with multiple different pieces of financial technology simultaneously and have it all work in one or, or not work at all um, is something that's incredibly unique uh, and incredibly powerful uh, as a concept and it's something you can't do with traditional finance. And I think the other thing is that it's really just easier to use. Um, if you, if you want to get involved in finance, almost in any sense, even if it's not crypto based these days, it's actually easier to do this on the crypto platform than in many traditional financial uh, technologies. Uh, even if you want to sort of be someone who's, you know, let's say being a market maker, the, the advent of, you know, automated market makers makes this much, much easier. So I think it's uh, the thing that excites me about DeFi is the ability to not just do it permissionly, permissionlessly, but actually to do it more easily. Uh, and to be able to do things that you just can't do in the traditional financial sector. Uh, and when where REN fits into all of this is that uh, what our project is about is taking uh, tokens from different chains and making them accessible everywhere. So for example, uh, with, with the second largest amount of uh, tokenized Bitcoin on Ethereum, that's something like $300 million, uh, it's probably higher than that given the, the boost of Bitcoin today, um, living on Ethereum. Uh, and we're about to open that up to multiple other blockchains. But, but of course, Farcoin as well. So very soon in the next uh, two weeks or so, we anticipate being able to bring Farcoin onto Ethereum through RenVM and make it accessible as an ERC-20 token uh, as if it was natively an ERC-20 token. And this allows Phil to really tap into all of the existing DeFi infrastructure that's available today, whether that be automated market making or, or lending. Super exciting. I can't count the number of Twitter inbounds I've gotten on when that functionality would come into play. So it's super exciting that uh, you guys are working on it and making it become a reality. Uh, Stani, do you want to go next? Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think Corbin Long really, really, really well uh, described uh, what decentralized finance uh, is and, and, and the uh, capabilities. Uh, maybe I could add that in, in terms of like uh, developers uh, perspective, it's quite of a unique uh, system at the moment, it's especially like when you think about uh, financial applications or traditional Web2 building. So um, if you want to build a, uh, let's say financial application in, in, in the Web2 world, you kind of need to choose and get the permission and, and subscribe uh, into uh, terms and conditions and, and, and you, you kind of can't connect to everything that there is from, from whatever you want to achieve. And, uh, and, and what this means that uh, a lot of things become fractionalized or actually are fractionalized in, in, in finance. That, that, that is why we see different kinds of uh, interest rate depending on globally. Uh, we, we see uh, different kinds of financial services which, which are uh, where uh, it really depends on, on where you're living uh, and, and what kind of yields you, for example, get or, or what, what's accessible to you. And decentralized finance is interesting because uh, it's not just permissionless access to, to all of the infrastructure. For example, having a permissionless savings account uh, wherever you are, uh, but it's also means that anyone can actually build the next interesting financial application. So the, the kind of like threshold uh, is lower and not just you can build anything, uh, but also you can inter interact with everything that there is in the on-chain ecosystem. So there is this the, the interop interoper interoperability by default, which makes it uh, very interesting. Uh, from our perspective, uh, we, we've been building uh, decentralized finance very early or just, uh, let's say, financial applications on chain because the, ter the terminology was coined a bit later uh, than, than when we started. And our focus has been mostly uh, lending and borrowing. Uh, and, and we started with the uh, ETHLAND project, which evolved into a bigger 
um, kind of like a money market protocol, which Aave is today. And um, yeah, I would say kind of like our goal is, is to have interest rate on all of these uh, various different assets. And um, for example, where Corbin mentioned the, the project where uh, they could be um, uh, the, the tokenized version of file, uh, practically we would ha want to have some sort of a incentive interest rate on, on that. And I think there's like many things where um, basically a file coin fits into into our, our agenda and in infrastructure as well. But I, I will not ramble anymore and let, let you <laughs> continue from the, here. No, it's fantastic. Uh, this is just a great overview of what DeFi is and, and some how these protocols might interact and how you're how you're uh, each individually approaching the problem. Um, obviously, with the launch of Filecoin, we've opened up um, some new use cases, and I'm curious uh, how you guys think of the intersection of Filecoin and DeFi. What are the immediate use cases that you think that might open up? Um, for the for the intersection of those two those two uh, kind of protocols and trends, and maybe I'll turn to uh, Long first. Sure, I mean I think um, a long time ago, I mean a long time for crypto, there was this uh, meme I guess about decentralized applications and the ability to take applications and put them on chain and replicate the Web two world, but just in this decentralized world. Um, and I think that vision got stamped very uh, stamped out very quickly by the massive cost of storage and the massive cost of transactions on chain. Uh, for Filecoin's part, it obviously helps solve the storage side of things. Um, and other chains are either beginning to or um, soon to address the, the cost of transactions uh, and actually taking those actions specifically. Um, so I think, you know, Filecoin takes that problem and solves half of it, solves the, the storage side and lets other chains figure out how they want to solve um, the the transaction throughput side, which I think is great. You know, do one thing, do one thing well, um, leave the chains to figure out consensus on transactions and, and solve the storage problem. I think today we're, we're clearly seeing that the best kinds of decentralized applications are financial applications. And I think the reason for that is the cost of interacting with the chain. If you're gonna have to pay a couple of dollars every single time you wanna take an action, you really wanna be extracting value from that action in a very direct sense, which is why you want to be trading or you want, want to be using it to lend or farm yield because it's going to cost you to take this action. So you want to be able to recuperate that loss. You don't want to pay you know, 50 cents every time you send someone a message on, on a platform like Facebook, let's say, uh, or the equivalent in the de uh, decentralized world. Um, so I think today, big data sets in finance are uh, an obvious use case. Um, a, a lot of trading capability and a lot of investment knowledge comes through having big data sets and going to analyze those data sets. And so for its part in the ecosystem, I think Filecoin really helps uh, open the opportunity for a new class of uh, DeFi applications that can take advantage of huge amounts of data, which we currently can't put into a decentralized place or haven't been able to until very recently. That's fantastic. Uh, Stani, you know, we, we've been interacting with miners for, you know, a few months and a few years and especially recently. And, you know, as you know, like the uh, part of the Filecoin protocol is that a miner has to buy and post Filecoin as collateral, um, you know, in order to uh, run their operations and guarantee that they're not going to be dropping those files or, you know, messing with the consensus of the chain. Um, how do you think DeFi might be able to help uh, those types of people and, and how does, you know, Aave kind of play into that? Yeah, I, I think when it comes to collateralization, it, it's basically the, 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 the bread and butter of the, the Aave protocol. And, and, and basically that's a way to unlock liquidity. So uh, what, what, what traditionally like lending and borrowing in decentralized systems usually have been is that you practically have a... Uh, some sort of asset, a cryptographic asset that has some value, obviously because of the use case or the uh, governing functionality and, and you could pledge it as a uh, collateral or, or deposit first to earn interest on it and then use it as a collateral to, to basically um, un unlock some uh, liquidity. Or, I mean, uh, in other words, if that asset is in the protocol, it can be basically borrowed uh, and, and pledged actually into the uh, usability system, which, which basically is in, in this case, uh, the, the mining. So I could imagine uh, 
those could be pretty pretty interesting uh, use cases uh, in terms of like what comes to uh, lending and borrowing. Um, and I, I could actually even see that that could be something that uh, might come true uh, quite quite soon as well. Yeah, I think so too. I think uh, there are just like a number of different stakeholders that are looking to, to borrow Filecoin and be able to use it in different ways. And so that I think it could be a terrific use case out of the gate. Uh, and Corbin, I, I've always envisioned, you know, uh, you know, how storage could be a commodity, you know, like oil or energy at some point in the future. Like it's such a commoditized you know, piece of hardware in some respects, but in other respects, you know, clients do want to be able to choose where they store their data, the quality of the data center, uh, the reliability, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you think about um, the intersection of, of DeFi and Filecoin from a storage perspective, do you think storage becomes a commodity one day and there's uh, kind of like an order book, just like, you know, uh, just like uh, any kind of DeFi application there, or is it a little bit more differentiated? Curious to get your take on that. Yeah, uh, Colin's a, it's a good point. Um, I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and the the closest analogy I've come up with is owning file is like owning an IOU to internet real estate, right? You own file, and you know that you can upload data, content, your your website to file, you know, to the internet at some future point in time. And it can be accessed, which is which is actually first of its kind, and also makes it unlike all other cryptocurrency assets out on the market today, which makes it incredibly interesting to DeFi, right? So if we have tokenized fill on Ethereum, you can now put that in a bucket with tokenized Bitcoin, Ether, governance tokens, you know, other types of crypto assets, and over time, these things are going to be completely uncorrelated. Right. And so if you have it in an Ave lending market, that asset is going to be behaving totally different than some of the other assets in the lending market, which gets me very excited. Um, quickly, I also just wanted to back up Long's point about the fact that Ethereum state is bursting at the seams right now. And so now having the Filecoin network where we can put some of those data heavy tasks on things like payout schedules, things like bonding curves can easily be moved over to the Filecoin network and be accessible from DeFi applications. I think you're going to have all types of oracles kind of back and forth. And then I think even for the most short term uh, Filecoin use case for DeFi is simply hosting front ends, right? Uh, a lot of these applications are totally permissionless on the back end, but the front end still needs to be hosted on your AWS and your Azure. Um, and so rather than open sourcing the code and allowing anybody to throw up all these duplicative front ends, you now can have a permissionless front end that can now match the permissionless back end of these DeFi applications. So um, backing up Long's point, backing up Stanny's point of people being able to borrow fill easily to fulfill mining resources and actually be able to stake that and actually make it income generating. Folks that want to earn yields on Filecoin holdings can transfer it into a tokenized version and then lend it out via these markets. And then even just hosting the front end applications. Those four or five are the short term use cases that I think this fill uh, DeFi intersection is really going to kind of pop up over the next coming months. Uh, to, to add to Corbin's point, actually, uh, if, even like you, you could uh, basically commoditize uh, a piece of front end in the sense that you could reuse in different uh, places and locations, kind of like what we have with the uh, node packages. And that could be pretty, uh, uh, pr pretty cool. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Corbin. That's that's just like a, an awesome set of things to explore for our community and some of our users and things like that. Um, I want to just kind of back up and you know, outside the Filecoin uh, sphere, you know, certainly centralized exchanges used to dominate, and now tons of liquidity pools like Uniswap are increasingly a viable alternative. And so I'm curious how you guys think. You know, what changes do you see causing this in the overall crypto landscape uh, going forward? And just trying to get your take on on things things like that in the future. I think it's all about 
ease of use and composability. Um, if you want to participate in a centralized exchange, or let's say there are two centralized exchanges that you want to participate in, they have different tokens or whatever, you're constantly having to balance your liquidity across those and they have different deposit times and different withdrawal times. Uh, and of course, you're, you're uh, depending on the exchange, you're having to provide sensitive data about yourself that you may not trust that person to keep safe. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you kind of, it's actually, although while you're on the exchange, the experience might be better because you're getting um, tighter spreads, you're getting deeper liquidity, uh, you're getting faster transactions, uh, you've got more traditional trading types like, like limit orders. Um, ultimately, it's still actually higher friction because if, if you hold crypto in uh, a wallet, the I guess the distance, if you want to think about it, from that wallet to an exchange is greater than from that wallet to an automated market maker. You only have to place a single transaction and then you're in. And I think a lot of um, a lot of retail, they're not sophisticated. And so working against an automated market maker where you just get an instant price and you're essentially just doing market buys all the time is turns out to actually be totally feasible. Um, I think the other nice thing is that you get a huge amount of volume coming through arbitrage where these automated market makers can all be hit simultaneously with a single transaction and the arbitrageur can essentially attempt to buy on one venue and sell on another in a single transaction. And then if it turns out not to be profitable, they can just revert sort of both actions simultaneously. You can't do that on a centralized exchange. Once an action is taken, it's taken and you can't sort of bind one action on one exchange to an action on another exchange. Um, so I think that sort of composability aspect, uh, which is something that Stanny mentioned earlier about, I guess, this interoperability between protocols is a huge leg up for uh, automated market makers and DEXs in general. Because it also applies, you know, maybe you want to take a short position on something, so you borrow it, you can just immediately sell it in the exact same transaction. There doesn't have to be a difference in time between borrowing an asset and selling it uh, to enter your, your short position. And so I think in the future where this is going to go is we're going to see this spill over to multiple chains. Um, different chains are going to have different specialties. They're going to be good at different things. Um, they're going to make different trade-offs and people are going to access those trade-offs for different reasons. And you're going to have different developers building different products in different places. And as a result, you're going to need some kind of interoperability between these chains to keep that composable nature of DeFi uh, sort of there and available and, and easy to do. And so I think what we're going to see is just as much as we saw a migration of people uh, or of liquidity rather into decentralized products, we'll start seeing that liquidity disseminate and grow across multiple chains uh, at once. Yeah, I would, uh, I would just piggyback off that and say, you know, composability, I think is as big of a leg up as usability for things like DEXs. Um, a lot of people call them money Legos in the DeFi space because the different combinations that you can plug together, like it is literally like an engineer's like dream to like figure out how you can like merge a lending protocol with like a flash loan system over here, which, which Ave, you know, helped pioneer. Um, something like a flash loan isn't even feasible, wouldn't even come up if you just had a centralized exchange spot market. Right. It only becomes up. It only comes up because we have stable coins first, then automated market makers. And then it starts to make sense to have these this functionality that can only exist on crypto systems. And I think because we have more and more building blocks daily, you're going to have more and more applications that can only exist on a crypto system, which is like the most exciting thing about working in this space. Um, bringing it back to Filecoin real quick, now we're adding the information and data side of the internet with the internet of value or the internet of money, and you can transact freely across them, whether it's packaged front ends like Stani mentioned, whether it's DAOs paying their own hosting costs from their treasury, right? We don't even have to go through AWS and Azure anymore, right? The DAO can go straight from ETH to tokenize fill to fill, and they're your hosting costs right there. We're going to have all these new types of like experiments and applications that just weren't even possible before because of that composability. And that's, uh, that's what gets us devs excited about this system is because you wake up and there's a new, there's a new Lego block that you're playing with each day. Yeah, yeah, I, I, def I definitely agree. I mean, the, the interoperability uh, is, is something that really uh, you know, it, 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 it puts liquidity from one place to another very quickly. I mean, 
yeah, you can really quickly switch venues. Uh, let's say if you use something like MetaMask, and that's that's pretty pretty interesting, and and protocols consuming each other, and it, it really boils down to to um, what was said previously by by Corbin and Long that that and the, it's it's so easy, and and you know it's just like even if you pay, I mean, gas cost has been high uh, periodically, but even though I mean, if, if you tr if you're a DeFi user already, and you, you kind of like have been onboarded into the ecosystem, it's just so easy to trade and, and you know, swap one currency to another or deposit somewhere, uh, get some yield and redeposit it somewhere else. Um, compared to all the barriers that you have in centralized exchanges and and, and the, the biggest barrier is, is really the interoperability because if you have your funds stuck in one place, you can't just shop easily around if you haven't onboarded into another place and still it's quite clunky. So, you, so, so uh, having this permissionless uh, ecosystem is, is def definitely something uh, uh, very valuable because uh, when, when financial applications started in, 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 in on, on top of Ethereum, uh, there wasn't much of an ecosystem and it felt very isolated and there wasn't that much growth. But as, as there is, there's more, different kinds of uh, uh, model Legos, as Corbin said, uh, basically you have a lot of things you could do and you could quickly try new things. So if there's tomorrow or today or after this 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 uh, panel, there's some new uh, DeFi um, products, you could try them out fairly quickly if you have already something like con connectivity, like the, the, the MetaMask and and that's that's pretty um, uh, pr pretty cool. And, and many of, of, of uh, uh, in, in the future, uh, because of the kind of issues with, with the front ends that you really don't want to, uh, you know, host centrally uh, front ends, you really want to have some sort of uh, decentralized storage and solution for, for that. And this is like a very uh, big value proposition hold the DeFi ecosystem. I, I, I definitely believe in that. Awesome. Fantastic. So we only have a few minutes left, if you can believe it here. Uh, you know, as I've kind of talked to the various builders that are joining the Filecoin ecosystem, you know, these can be folks that are like hacking in hackathons or that are in formal accelerator programs like Gitcoin's Apollo that just presented, you know, their big cohort this morning or, or Tachyon's Launchpad that has a whole bunch of folks. A shocking number of builders are, are thinking about DeFi solutions on Filecoin or around Filecoin, et cetera. And so I'm curious um, if we just go through, uh, what advice would you have for those builders as they kind of get into the DeFi space and the inter intersection of DeFi and Filecoin? Stani, do you want to go first? I, I, I think when it comes to let's say um, intersection with with with, with uh, file storage and 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 DeFi, I I think just like the the creativity of how you could use data, and 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 like offload that data away from from let's say the transactional uh, blockchains, for example Ethereum, and 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 make uh, you know value added uh, through the uh, storage systems and. You know, I, I think there's plenty of things to do uh, in terms of if, if you if you're hacking something, and and reducing a single point of failures uh, is something that's uh, pretty pretty cool. But also, I would like to emphasize that uh, building tools is is is, is super uh, appreciated, and and that that is how also the Ethereum ecosystem grow quite a lot because uh, a couple of years ago was way more difficult to you know build things because there is wasn't that many tools around and also less libraries and 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 kind of like uh, i recommend building building tools and, and libraries that help other um, developers uh, or users awesome long yeah i mean i would recommend two things one is that embrace the composable nature i think one of the interesting things about things being so composable in DeFi is that it's ultimately better for the user because you can't keep users by creating moats um, because then they just won't use your system uh, so you just have to build something fundamentally better and in that vein i think something that's super interesting about phil for builders especially in terms of what they might want to create is that for the first time we see the tokenization of essentially what is a commodity storage that's not actually fundamentally a financial instrument. 
It's actually a functional instrument. Storage is actually used for something. And this makes it inherently different to what you might think of about uh, how you might think about other tokens that exist in DeFi today, especially you know things like stable coins, for example, or Bitcoin itself, which is very much a directly a finance, financial object in and of itself in some capacity. Whereas Phil is inherently more about storage, which is something functional. And so this, I don't know, I, <laughs> you can think about it in a fundamentally different way and potentially build applications that we can't even think of today. Um, what, is it, what does it actually mean to lend storage? Um, is that functionally different from lending a financial asset? And if it is, can you think of a DeFi application specifically around that concept and, and the root meaning of lending storage uh, that can make it unique and offer something uh, just categorically different to what we see today? That is awesome. That is awesome. Corbin? Yeah, so, so my advice is actually going to be two parts and it's slightly conflicting. Uh, so the first part is, you know, absolutely build those things that aren't, aren't even possible today, right? The crypto and just Web3 sector moves so quickly that you have to have your head kind of six months out and kind of understand where things are going. What tools are going to be available in six months? You know, if this application that's starting to take off actually hits scale, what does that mean here, here, and here? So I always encourage developers to be like, like almost unrealistically creative with the solutions that they're coming up with things like, you know, lending storage, like what is, you know, what does that even mean? Or like what happens when a DAO can pay for their hosting costs with lossless rewards accumulated from a protocol like Aave, like all types of crazy stuff. Um, but then part two is kind of the, the solve real problems, right? Um, I think web three and crypto also spends a lot of time, you know, in the idea space, which is absolutely fun. It's, it's amazing. It's great to sit around with your friends and have a beer and talk about. But at the end of the day, if we want this stuff to be impactful, we have to solve real people's problems. And a lot of times that's people beyond just our crypto sphere. So, and there, there are plenty of problems out there, whether it's privacy or you know, data silos, there's, there's all types of stuff that you can go after but make sure to ground all these fantastically creative ideas with reality and things that people actually want. Fantastic. Well, well thank you all for, for coming to this uh, amazing panel here. I, I, I got to say, it's just super exciting because some of the products that you are collectively working on are some of the most anticipated ones by our users, our miners, our token holders. So you're going to get a lot of pings and a lot of interesting feedback pretty soon. Uh, thank you for being pioneers in the intersection of DeFi and Filecoin. And thanks for joining the panel. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, guys. Good thanks, time. Everyone. Thanks, Take everyone. Care. Thank Bye. you.